Maybe it's because the gospel reading is so extreme in the words of Jesus that it passes on to us that I ended up coming to start the season of creation to such a remote and beautiful but challenging place as the edge of Rannoch Moor here at Karua. With sensitive management, this area is well on the way to being once more a crown jewel of carbon capture, though it's also a place where the Scottish midge in countless billions has been given by God a home, a habitat. Heaven and earth, sky and soil, starry vault and boggy peat bear witness to this. But as we heard, it's in the wilderness, the place may be managed but definitely not totally determined by human interest, that the law of survival is graciously given and proclaimed, that warnings are unmistakably good news. This place is wonderful and awe-inspiring. It's a massive landscape filled with tiny wonders. Yet it's also very demanding to spend time in, even if you do take some measures to protect yourself from the midges. So out of the difficult beauty of this wilderness, this is my message to everyone in the churches who takes notice. Whatever it takes, if you aspire to discipleship, if you're called to mission, find out as a pious, religious, devotional exercise what you can do to fall in love with creation, because without that love, you will not do justice to our special human calling as shepherds, as partners, as creatures amongst creatures, with that special job of tilling and keeping, of intervening in partnership with the earth for the flourishing of all life, not just our own. Go out and pick litter from beaches, grow food, heal, hurt with a community garden. Hug those trees, sniff those flowers before you step on the stinging nettles. Savour those wonderful wee things which will convince you to take not just the first step, but the next and the next. It's not some soft option to, to grow out of or, or lose sight of in the toxic stress of modern living. Even just pause for a moment and hear the birds as they greet the dawn tomorrow morning. Join their prayer. I make no apology for the time I've spent this year getting close to and observing those of our fellow creatures who are a wee bit easier to love. Even though even creatures as graceful and beautiful as, as Arctic terns, if they feel you are a threat to their young and their nests, they will come out on the attack. So no apology because there is so much bad news to cope with. People in, people in the hostel where I'm staying assumed that my message would be gloom and doom, but of course, it's about joy. Discipleship needs to be fed as well as committed. For me, if there are oyster catchers, there must be a god and face to face with a puffin, which is an experience future generations might be deprived of by climate change. It's difficult not to be moved to intoxicating delight in what God can do. It's no coincidence that this July, the United Nations Biodiversity Body has called us to value the spiritual and emotional connection that people have with wildlife. If you're watching this, as far as anyone else is concerned, you are spiritual people. For the good of the planet, do not hold back. Then I walk into a cloud of midges. Just as wonderful, I tell myself rationally, and I pray, may I cherish love towards all creatures. But I'm interested in how Luke's Gospel repeatedly acknowledges some things about which negotiation is non-negotiable. As non-negotiable as whether you love or hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters. Yes, and even life itself. Which I'm going to take lazily as in, on the easiest possible reading for now. Namely that to ask what is it and who is it for whom would you set aside what seems urgent and imperative, even if what is set aside is for the good of those you love and for the good of creation? If you knew that getting on that plane for a domestic flight was the same as wiping out those puffins, 
What is it and who is it that you will listen to first? What lifestyle would you cling to? What car would you insist on driving? However many layers of the safety net, beyond however many unexpected last chances, as far as the ultimatum, the tipping point of no return, which is definitely not lacking in Jesus' teachings. You don't have to be a loony street preacher to notice that. Indeed, you have to work quite hard to ignore it. Does your idea of discipleship involve seeking out that truth which, when you choose to stop believing in it, does not go away? Because that's when you find out. We will not, repeat, will not just solve this crisis. That tower won't be built. That overwhelming enemy will not be defeated. The ship has sailed. We cannot and therefore we will not continue as we have done. Now, since COP, the UK plans seem to be seriously going ahead for more oil, more coal. The power of humiliation clearly isn't what it was in Jesus' time, though reputational harm inflicted by the widespread ethical disinvestment from those companies has carried some clout. That sanction of shame, shunning and ridicule, it's no trivial matter in scripture. It goes to the heart of the arrogance of the ostentatious tower builder. Looking at the skyline of London and of many great cities, we don't need to be Jesus's first century hearers to know that the aspiration to build a tower is a claim to power based on security. If you make me your king, I will protect you. The great investment of a high tower always implied a lookout post, a protective measure against oncoming threats. So what a ludicrous waste are the skyscrapers of high finance if they neither see the end of oil coming nor offer protection from the heat waves and the floods that we have seen globally this year. More and more frequent with every tonne of carbon beyond what is captured by the trees, the seas, the peat bogs. And of course in capturing that CO2 the oceans themselves are made acid. Unsurprisingly, there were folk at COP who were immune to all the ludicrous and entertaining greenwashing around them, looking instead for signs that the promises to make good polluters' debt would be honoured, loudly doing the job of heaven and earth, and noisily witnessing to thousands of billions of damage demonstrably caused by the biggest polluters. Now, for any amongst us, or maybe in your congregation, who amazingly still cling on to the grotesque idol of God's in charge so we don't need to worry about climate change, it is Jesus himself. Yes, Jesus, argue with him if you like. Jesus who belabors us with scenarios requiring sacrifice and compromise, warnings of so many cliff edges, warnings to provoke alertness and urgency and change. And that is the good news. That is gospel. That's when kingdom comes close, when we take notice, and having taken notice, when we get on with it. But back down to earth, down to the mud and the peat of Rannoch Moor, and the wildlife I try to love that loves the bogs. When they asked the reformer Jean Calvin about bitey insects, he replied with a theological twinkle in his eye, I think, that, that in these we encounter God as avenger. These things that, like it or not, that however holy your life, you are going to have to live with one day, one way or another. Science confronts us with what religious folk once knew, but more recently have tried to ignore, that the wasp that stings and the moth who eats holes in your clothes have their part to play with the countless species around us who are always there, living their lives unknown to us until we turn aside and get to know them. That's what we did at Wildlife Week this year on Iona. Every night we set a moth trap, every morning we marvelled at the creatures we've always shared a home with, but most likely never seen. And of course we released them unharmed. It's like, it's like discovering your long lost family, a place in your heart for the life of the world. Preparing you for those twists and turns and blind alleys, the steep rocky slope, 
which means you're not going to reach the top of that particular mountain. Though with the knowledge that these things might happen comes the chance to modify the outcome, at least some of the time, or mitigate or negotiate. And whereas it's a liberating article of our faith that God is beyond our understanding, nonetheless I hope it is right to understand that God is not simply peevish. So often I've had to observe how Scripture presents the wrath of God as the things we've desanctified as cause and effect. Jump a fence without looking, or indeed jump anywhere on a peat bog, and you'll be up to your eyes in what you might have avoided. But even more, it needs to be pointed out that the experience of this wrath of God, the rebellion of nature with a cause, is not the end of the story. It's an experience which makes change of direction all the more urgent, devout, costly. The sort of thing discipleship has to be about. In Deuteronomy 30, in a very different sort of wilderness, we find Moses passing on that which God desires God's people to be confronted with, calling also upon heaven and earth as witness against them. There are few legal cultures where to be witness does not imply sentience and the possession of faculties of discernment, nor is this any mere flourish of legalistic rhetoric. It is nothing so easy to dismiss. The intimate closeness of human justice and health and the well-being of the land, of the earth, is taken for granted throughout the Old Testament and, of course, in many indigenous views around the planet. Thus, the establishment of the covenant relationship which is delineated in Deuteronomy 30 involves the directly interactive relationship of the people with their environment of sky and soil of heaven and earth. And with all the life which is likewise given a home as we are given a home because they love the sweetness of life. In words we hear in Luke 14, Jesus speaks in such a way as to dispel all complacency, invoking the terror in his audience, both of personal humiliation and that of brutal sacking of cities by armies which tragically has not been consigned to the rubbish heap of history. As with so many of Jesus' parables, damage is done, but help may still be offered. Damage is done, but it's not too late yet. That's a vital principle in the development of our spiritual resilience to the messy, locked-in turmoil of the climate crisis. So, negotiation, adaptation, mitigation would seem to be an appropriate mission for anyone who's trying to be a disciple of this hard-headed, robustly compassionate Christ.